Okay. Well, thanks for doing this for us. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about how um, you play two characters, a character in each film. You want to drive us through that? I'll drive you through that, no pun intended. Well, obviously in Planet Terror, I am Cherry Darling, and I have Machine Gun Leg, which is amazing and cool, and I basically get to play the male role, which is awesome. And she's not masculine, but she's doing everything typically that the man would do, i.e. saving the world. And then in Death Proof, kind of Quentin gets me back for that. Because poor Pam, you know, I wanted her to look really angelic and sweet, and so I, you know, I had Quentin, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, having a different look from Cherry, and so we settled on something really soft and blonde. And there's a 60s actress, an Italian actress named Barbara Boucher that he loves, and it wound up just kind of coincidentally, the hair, everything looking almost exactly like her, kind of freakishly so, so he was over the moon. And in Death Proof, you know, my character has a lot to do mostly with uh, Warren, played by Quentin, and Kurt Russell, which was great. Great. So, could you talk a little bit about how empower you know empowering it must be to play a woman with a machine gun leg? I think it'd be empowering to be anybody with a machine gun leg. It's all the best when you have a mini skirt. Because I figure a guy would have to do a cut off leg on a shorts, and that wouldn't look so pretty. I think you know, obviously, there are many situations where that could come in handy, <laughs> and really only from the mind of Rodriguez, which is just a gift. Exactly. Um, and could you tell us, kind of give us uh, your take on the plot, like the evolution of your character and then what happens? The evolution, especially of Cherry, is great because she's, you know, kind of a loser, basically. And she has kind of a dead-end job, dead-end town, really getting pretty bummed out with life and really beautiful opening dance sequence. And then she collapses in tears. What's going on? What's happening in this movie? And then, you know, kind of it all starts snowballing from there, and things just go from bad to bad to worse to worse. And then, you know, eventually she has to rise up, come into her power, strap her gun leg on, and save the world. Yeah, basically, the, can you give us a little bit description about how the zombies are attacking, how all hell is breaking basically, loose? Yeah, then... all hell is breaking loose. We don't know what's going on. And, you know, the government has kind of, uh, the army has done sort of an testing experiment because we're a little landlocked town and nobody really cares about us so they can infect these people and then see if this antidote they came up with actually works and then obviously they could sell that for billions of dollars but of course their specimens i.e. sick people get loose in the town and just kind of go on a rampage so to speak and all of a sudden you know this calm little town just everything it's just like the hell's going on and, and what's fantastic about it is you know, in the old Grindhouse movies, there'd be missing reels and jump cuts and these crazy things. And then all of a sudden, in this, you go from having this, you know, kind of love scene or whatever, and then the film burns because it's too hot, which used to happen on real film, nitrates. And then all of a sudden, you jump, and it's full-fledged, you know, fire everywhere, like craziness going on, like sick, like blistering people going on. It's like uh, rampages everywhere, and you're just kind of, you know, the audience completely went with it, like, Everyone's laughing so you know what's going on. That's, I guess, what used to happen in those films. You just, something would go missing, and now you're just playing catch up, but it's hilarious. Well, which leads to how great is it to work with Quentin and Robert, these fans of these kind of movies who must have brought a great passion to doing this double feature? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, they both, you know brought great passion to it, you know, to do these movies. You have to have great love for those, you know, kind of movies. To do an homage, obviously you like it so much that you're doing that in the first place to kind of take on this endeavor. It was great watching Kurt and Quentin because, you know, Kurt had been in some of those films and obviously Quentin's seen every film on the planet. <laughs> so that just watching those two just trade stories and even knowing from the same, like, most obscure actors. And it was great because Quentin had movie night at his house, so he, we did a quick crash course in all these you know, crazy movies. And they're so much fun and so weird. And I guess you're just kind of there, so you think, why not one more creepy, freaky thing? And then, you know, Robert is very methodical, but very, very quiet, very intense, because he edits at night after he shoots, you know, literally physically during the day. So there's so much going on that everybody's, you know, paying really, really close attention. So they're very, very different personalities, but I think that's why they work so well together and why they're such close friends. And what was it like for you playing the lead in, the, in a grindhouse film? Because it's obviously a different kind of genre. Like, what does the actress feel like? Well, how do I play this? Could you talk, talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm not really, I, I think I was, I was never trying to be an actress. So I don't really ever come from the, my character, I'm like, I don't, I don't really kind of enjoy that sort of line of dialogue so much. I just kind of instinctively go with it. I get her. You know, if, if someone thinks I should be playing it different, you know, they tell me and I adjust. I don't you know, have a great backstory. I'm sure she has a great backstory, but I'm not going to sit and go write 500 pages on it. It's pretty instinctive with her. It's, it's, uh, and, and with Robert, 
he's so smart. You just kind of you know strap your seatbelt on and go for the ride. It's like, all right, I'm open. Yeah, I mean, really, this just film is like it. a thrill ride. It's right. like a, it's a, like a roller coaster ride. It's a complete it? roller coaster. You just strap in and you're like, hell yeah. So you just kind of go for it. You know, again, no shy people. No, you know, it, this would not be a good part for any kind of girl that was like, ow, this hurts, or I, oh, and it, that would not work because I was coming home battered and bruised, but I thought it was cool because, you know, I have this kind of like dainty little body and I was doing these like kind of tough guy things. It was, it was, I was proud of myself physically. No, you should be because it really, I mean, what does it feel like to be, you know, when so many films have like the man wielding the machine gun? Exactly. Here there's a woman in the leading role playing this action part. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, Robert and I had met at Cannes uh, two years ago, and I was just talking about film in general, and I wasn't doing the thing of the woman complaining, oh, there's no roles for women in Hollywood, yada, yada. Probably true. But <laughs> it was more specific to why couldn't the girl be the guy? I mean, other than if you have a male character who has a very specific male, you know, like love affairs or something, if it's more of an action movie, although this movie's actually more than that, but let's say it's just an action movie, there's really no reason it can't be the girl. There's no reason the girl can't be the hero of everything. And oh, so he kind of kind of went on with that thought. And you know, he met me and he I guess liked me and kind of created it from there. And then he just called me one day in traffic and he said, I thought of it. She has to have a machine gun like that'll get asses in seats. I was like, I just started laughing. I was like, okay, you know, game for anything. And the technology wasn't there when he wrote it, so we really had to go through a lot of trial and error and a lot of um Again, bumps and bruises and finding the right thing. And I saw it the other night, and uh, I snuck down to see it with a regular audience. It was so much fun. And people were just laughing and cheering and covering their eyes and laughing more. It was the best. Great. And then, uh, just can you just give me a night a description of Death Proof? What the story of Death Proof? Death Proof is basically this creepy old stuntman, stuntman Mike, who likes to take his car and and torture women with it, and it kind of. You know, he's basically, I would imagine, a serial killer and uses his car as an analogous to kind of, I think, sex acts with women. It's what gets him off, so to speak. And it becomes an extension of him, if you will. So he, you know, is in this little town and he sees these girls that he likes and kind of starts just like stalking them with his car. And then eventually there's a big hullabaloo and crash, et cetera, et cetera. And then another group of girls that he finds and starts stalking. They eventually turn the tables on him. So it's kind so of So the creepy. girls win in both. I was, I'm sorry for talking over you. But, no. um, so it's kind of creepy and dark in, in a very different way, right? It is. And the thing with Quentin is it's, just, it's slower, so you're kind of like, oh, and you're just listening to these girls talk, and it's funny, and you're laughing, and all of a sudden, you know, it got real quiet at one point, and just with the, everybody's, you know, in the audience, like, I can't believe that just happened. It's like you're just kind of like getting kind of like gone along and all of a sudden you get a major sucker punch. And then, so it makes his comeuppance all the better. And it's a great character. Stuntman Mike character is fantastic. Great. Thank you very much.